Income tax 2023-2024. Depreciation listed property introduction. Get ready and some coffee because to be a great tax preparer, you got to be like a scarecrow outstanding in your field. Most of first, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. This information can be found in Publication 946, How to Depreciate Property, Section 179, Deduction, Special Depreciation Allowance, Makers Listed Property, and More Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here, having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. Noting the sole proprietorship Schedule C rolls into line one income of the formula. The Schedule C itself, basically an income statement, having business income minus business expenses, which you could call business deductions resulting in, in essence, net business income, which is what rolls in from Schedule C to line one income of the formula. The formula outlining the calculation on the Form 1040, this being the first page of the Form 1040, Schedule C ultimately rolling into line number eight. Additional income from Schedule 1. This is the Schedule 1. Additional income and adjustments to income. Part 1. Additional income. Where the Schedule C rolls into line 3. Business income or loss. This is the Schedule C. Profit or loss from business. Having an income statement. P&L or profit and loss format. Income minus expenses. Noting that we're looking at the expenses. Usually the largest category in different types of items. Uh, in the expenses, some of those categories more complex than others, such as depreciation, where, as we've seen in prior presentation, even if using a cash-based system, the tax code forcing us to then do an accrual thing with the depreciation. So, for example, just a quick recap. If we had a $10,000 piece of depreciable property, we would like to just expense it at the point in time we purchased it because one, that's the easy thing to do, and two, we get the biggest deduction soon as possible. But the code might force us to put it on the books as an asset. When we have an asset, we need a balance sheet, which we don't, don't have here. This is an income statement. So we can use schedules for the balance sheet account of asset account, property, plant, and equipment giving us the PP&E as well as the accumulated depreciation and the expense calculation, expensing part of it in the form of depreciation over the useful life, remembering that we might be able to depreciate most, if not all of it, up front with the use of a 179 or special depreciation deduction, which we talked about in prior presentations, which would basically beg the question of why didn't you just let me deduct it in the first place on a cash-based method? And the answer is, of course, that the code is trying to do the proper accrual thing. And then the tax code is also making other adjustments for politics and lobbying and whatever else they're trying to do. So the 179 and special depreciations you would think would vary over time. But the maker's depreciation, because it's based on accounting principles, you would think would be kind of the more solid thing that we would see uh, lasting uh, over time, which is usually a, like a double declining half year type of convention. Now, we also have things like automobiles, for example, uh, and other listed property where the IRS is possibly more skeptical of us abusing the tax code. And you can imagine why you can say, okay, well, if I'm a business person and I try to buy like a $400,000 car, 
just to drive me from to my clients places of business the IRS might see that as extreme and say, hey, look, we don't think you should be allowed this huge deduction because it seems like that's kind of partially personal and not business, right? So they might put certain limitations on listed property. And that's what we're gonna get into in more detail here. The most common one most likely being an automobile, for example. All right, so listed property, what is it? This chapter discusses the deduction limits and other special rules that apply to certain listed property. Listed in property includes cars and other property used for transportation, property used for entertainment, and certain computers. Now, again, you can see why this would be the case because obviously your car, you know, you might make the argument, hey, I need a fancy car. I need, I'm, I'm, you know, you might, you can look at these, these people that basically sell their services and tell you how to be the best person and how to get a bunch of money and get rich and women and whatnot. And they need a fancy car to do that. Right. And then you can make that argument, but the IRS is probably not really into that. And so they're probably going to, they're going to try to limit that some bit and entertainment, same kind of thing. Obviously, entertainment might be important because that's going to help you to possibly pull in clients. But you could see why the IRS would would put a limit to that. Say, hey, look, that looks kind of personal as opposed to all business. Same with computers. If you bought the fancy computer and you're using it for gaming and stuff and all that kind of stuff, you can see why the IRS might say, hey, look, that doesn't seem like it's completely business related or something like that. Right. So they might put limits on the deductibility of that advanced deduction for example, with the listed property. Deductions for listed property other than certain leased property are subject to the following special rules and limits. So you got deduction for employees, business use uh, requirement, and uh, passenger automobile limits and rules. So we'll go into a bit of more of these uh, in this section in future presentations. Deduction for employees. So if your use of the property is not for your employer's convenience or is not required as a condition of your employment, you cannot deduct depreciation or rent expenses for your use of the property as an employee. Now, notice that's going to be generally uh, the situation for many kind of deductions, the general idea being if we are a W-2 employee, then typically we don't get a lot of the deductions, including possibly depreciation deductions, because the idea is that the employer is the one that's going to be providing, you know, most of the expenses and so on. It's usually when we're having our own business as the Schedule C, where we're not the employee, we're the owner that, that we're thinking about the possibility of getting more of these deductions that are business related, possibly including depreciable property, possibly including say a car, which we might get a depreciation from, but limited to some extent in the accelerated depreciation due to it being a car. And so business use requirement. So if the property is not used predominantly more than 50% for business, for qualified business use, you cannot claim the Section 179 deduction or special depreciation allowance. We touched on this before when we looked at the special depreciation 179 deduction. Remember the idea being, if I bought a $10,000 piece of equipment, then you would think I'd be able to depreciate that over the useful life. But the 179 and special depreciation might allow me to get most, if not all of it up front uh, when I purchase it, basically allowing me, in essence, to expense it up front. But what if I use part of that property for personal versus business? So if I bought a $10,000 piece of equipment and it wasn't listed property, then you would think then I'd, I'd have to break out the personal versus business use. So I might use it like 80% business or something like that. And you would think I would be able to depreciate the portion 80% that's related to the business. Uh, but then, so then there's a question of, well, can I get the 179 deduction if there's a breakout between business and personal? And possibly yes, but possibly up to the 50% limit. In other words, if you use it less than 50% for business, then you may no longer be able to get the upfront deductions of the 179 and special. Remembering that this is often most likely to be something that happens with our automobile which also, which is going to be subject to some limitations, right? Because usually the automobile is the thing that we're trying to depreciate 
which has both a business and personal component uh, to it. So in addition, you must figure any depreciation deduction under makers using the straight line method uh, over the ADS recovery period. Now remember that uh, that's not the normal recovery period. So that's gonna be the unusual uh, situation because it's under that 50%. You may also have to recapture, include in income, any excess depreciation claimed in previous years. In other words, if, for example, we had the property that was over 50% business use, and then we took a massive amount of depreciation in the first year because of the 179 or special depreciation, and then in the following year, we're reporting that it drops under the 15% use, then the IRS code is going to be saying, hey, look, you took this large depreciation deduction that usually should be allocated over the life of the property up front, uh, and, then, and then it wasn't even business use over the life of the property. So then that's why you might end up having to recapture some of that 179, which we talked about in prior presentation. So a similar inclusion amount applies to certain uh, leased property. So hopefully that's somewhat unusual that it would be like over 50, like over 50% use. And then in the following years, it drops under the 50% the use, in which case you took a bunch of depreciation up front, possibly because of the 179 deduction, but you want to keep that in mind. So passenger automobile limits and rules. So annual limits apply to depreciation deductions, including section 179 deductions and any special depreciation allowance for certain passenger automobiles. So the passenger automobiles are the ones or part of the ones that the IRS are going to be skeptical of. And therefore, you've got the normal limitations for things like the 179 deduction and special depreciation and possibly other more stringent, typically, limitations for passenger automobiles. So you can continue to deduct depreciation for the unrecovered basis resulting from these limits after uh, the end of the recovery period, meaning it's basically a timing difference, right? So if I bought a $10,000 car, for example, then I would like to take the whole thing as an expense upfront as a 179 or special depreciation, and that would be great. I'd get the benefit as soon as possible. But if they're gonna limit me on the amount I can deduct, let's say it was 100% used for business, but they're not gonna let me deduct the whole thing upfront, they only let me deduct, you know, 3,000, on the car up front, then it's not like I lose the other 7,000. It's just that I have to take that potential deduction, that potential energy over the useful life of the car, typically using something like a double declining uh, method, uh, for example. Now, that that's not as good as deducting it up front, but it's just a timing difference. Uh, so we'll, we'll get the deduction over time is the general idea. So. This chapter defines listed property and explains the special rules and depreciation deduction limits that apply, including the special inclusion amount rule for leased property. It also discusses the record keeping rules for listed property and explains how to report information about the property on your tax returns. So remember that listed property, the ones the IRS is skeptical of, are the ones that you, you want to probably make sure that you're keeping accurate records about because those are the ones that the IRS is possibly most likely to question you on, right? Question you on things like the stuff that you had that's related to entertainment that you wrote off to business, your automobile that can seem like it could be personal versus business and so on, right? So useful items and uh, you may want to see. So here's some publications that you can use to drill down some more if you wanna dive on the research. You got publication 463, travel, gift, and car expenses. Publication 587, business use of your home. We might talk about that one more later. That's a big one. Uh, form and instructions. We have the form and instructions, 2106, employee business expenses, form 4562, depreciation and amortization, form 4797, sales of business property.